It's the most eagerly awaited film in years, and most of us will sit through it asking, how on earth did he do that? George Lucas's new Star Wars movie, his first in 15 years, takes special effects to new, mind-boggling levels. So far, it's cost $150 million, and he's financed it all himself. Next year, he'll start filming two more Star Wars movies here in Australia. With Leslie Stahl of American 60 Minutes in tow, George Lucas tonight takes us behind the scenes to show us how he weaves his magic. Why don't you take this guy, put him over here. All right. Back in there. Back take back. another one like him and stick him over here. In a darkened screening room, George Lucas is using a laser pointer to show the 45 computer animators who are working on his new Star Wars movie just how he wants a big battle scene to look. And then keep this guy here. Okay. And so then have him firing, instead of firing dead off to the right, have him fire over here. Everybody here works for Industrial Light and Magic, the special effects company Lucas created two decades ago to make the first Star Wars. Computer technology has advanced so much since then that the digital effects in the new episode are to the original roughly what talkies were to silent pictures. It's like sketching with a pencil and suddenly somebody gives you paint and it's got, you have all these colors. And you've always seen what you've been painting in color but you've never had the color to do it with. So now, finally, I've got color. And so now I can paint the way I was originally seeing things, and I like that. So do all the animators at Industrial Light and Magic, ILM. They don't just turn out special effects for Lucas. You name it, the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, the tornadoes in Twister, the aliens in Men in Black, they all came out of the computers at ILM. Now, with Star Wars, Lucas is expecting ILM to set a new standard in WOW. The work is so complicated and meticulous that each animator is responsible for just two seconds of finished film per week. Twice a week, they show their blink-of-an-eye shots to the boss. Now this is the new Darth Maul jumping off. Hmm. Yeah, that's a lot better. I think that works way better now. You've seen these before, and yeah. there have been changes, and now this and is now the I'm final approval. The changes. Yeah, I love this. See, this is this is this was actually shot out in the desert in 150 degree heat. Now, how did you do those animals? Are they camels that you've changed? Well, they're old cyber animals. Cyber animals? There's a new term. Actually, it's one of the big breakthroughs in the new movie all kinds of cyber characters completely conjured up from the computer. That guy's a cyber character. He's not real. The guy that was jumping. The way they used to make movies, that guy would have been a stunt double. In Lucas's movie, stunt doubles are just created in the computer. And not just doubles. He has several computer-generated lead characters full of personality and, and well, humanity. Look at this early version of a scene shot on location and covered with Lucas's editing notes. Any public credits? Any public credits are no good out here. I need something more real. Back at the computer, the guy in the hat gets deleted and replaced by a digital character. Only his voice remains. Any public credits? Any public credits are no good out here. I need something more real. I don't have. Ninety-five percent of digital movie which means that it's got digital characters or digital sets or something going on in it, where most movies, you know, it's about five to ten minutes at the most. On the digital back lot, a lightsaber fight can be shot like this and then made to look like this. Well, like that, that shot you saw, the landing platform. Yes. Uh, well, there's a whole scene that takes, well, actually there's two scenes that take place on that landing platform. Well. You couldn't build that set. I mean, there's just no way you could actually build something like that because it's in a completely fictitious city, a completely fictitious environment. It starts down in the library oh, in research, and this. then it comes up here to oh, conceptualize, God. and the art department designs the stuff while I'm writing the screenplay. Lucas began writing more than four years ago. As he did, 
his team of artists, headed by Doug Chang, started sketching and painting and modeling, working toward the Lucas seal of approval. I say, I need a bunch of creatures. <laughs> you know, give me a whole bunch of different creatures. So there's a bunch of artists, and they also have a contest, and I kind of, everybody submits stuff. And I say, well, I like this, but I like the head of this one. I want to put it on the body of this one. I like this, I like that. I like these features. Special attention was paid to lead characters like this guy named Jar Jar. How did those ears come about? Because we originally came up with Jar Jar. He had really short dog ears, and George thought he'd be more funny and have more personality with these big elephant-like ears. Once Lucas approved those ears, the model was sent to ILM and actually scanned into a computer in 3D. That's when Rob Coleman and his team of animators took over. A whole technology had to be developed to handle the ears because of the interaction of the cloth and the ears with his back. So that had to be invented. That wasn't here before. There was a little inklings of it. And, but, and you know. clothing. Nobody had ever done real clothing before. Yeah. I mean, realistic clothing that moves. Yeah. And he, he's a major character. So yeah. he has to have a real range yes. of oh, yeah. expressions and oh, emotions. Yes. We have 400 little sliders that we can change everything from cheek puffs to eye blinks to muscle bends to everything that layers into making this character as believable as the live action character standing beside him. The, the bar is at the highest when you have live action right on the screen. The audience is watching Liam Neeson and they've got Jar Jar there. And Liam Neeson is real, 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 real. And then we have to come up and make ours as real because if we don't, the audience will pick up on it immediately and say, there's something about that that's not, I don't believe that. Yeah. So you're out of the movie. It looks, yeah. it looks like you're, Roger you're Rabbit. Right. It. You yeah. can't have it be like Roger Rabbit. For 90% of the audience, you have to make it so that they just say, I don't know how they did it, it just was a real character. Yeah. Some purists worry that Lucas is making his computer characters too real. You know, people come and they say, oh, all this digital stuff, you know, doesn't that make everything phony? Doesn't that make it, you know, it's not true, it's not real. I said, you know, movies aren't true. It's all fake. The story is fake. Hello. The characters are fake. The sets are fake. There is no city there. That's not New York City. You go behind it. It's a big piece of wood with a painting on it. Uh, and all I'm doing is I've taken it to the next step. <laughs> My cutting is fat. My cutting. Just how big a technical milestone will the new movie be? We went to no less an authority than Steven Spielberg, one of Lucas's best friends and biggest customers. He's now not only taken images, but he's taken skies and clouds and backgrounds and atmospheres and light and shadow. And he's painted a world that would be cost prohibitive to do the old fashioned way. And it's not cost prohibitive? Uh, well, George owns ILM, so I'm not quite sure what kind of a break he's, he's getting from his own company. I have to think if, if I had made this movie, it would cost at least four times what it cost George to make. That's also because Spielberg's films are bankrolled by Hollywood. Lucas is paying for Star Wars entirely on his own. So he has an almost unprecedented amount of independence and control. When I make a movie, I pay attention to how much it costs, but at the same time I get to... You know, I get to do the things that I want to do without somebody arbitrarily coming in and saying, no, you can't do that. You know, you don't need that in the movie. That happened to Lucas at the beginning. Studio executives cut five minutes from his first hit, American Graffiti. That put a bitter taste in his mouth about Hollywood, and it sounded to us as if his resentment is as strong as ever. The problem is the studio executives. The problem is that the studios used to be owned by people who cared about the movies. Now they're corporations. They don't love movies. They don't go to movies. They don't know what a movie is. And they do focus groups to try to determine who will go see a movie. And Hollywood does that. And all Hollywood the time. does that. And they try to change the story to fit what the they think results. what the polling results are. And you can't do that. That's not the way you make movies. Um, because it is not a business. You know, it's an art form. An art form what Lucas kind of controls movie? completely. While his animators need his approval for every move they make, another group of artists need him to sign off on every sound effect in the movie. Ben Bird is in charge of all that sound. Very little of what is done on this film is truly synthesized. We record naturally existing sounds and modify them and process them. I have here my electric shaver and a salad bowl from home. And um, I discovered one day that if I took the electric shaver and put it in the salad bowl and moved it around, that you could get a very interesting resonance. 
Mm. Kind of like a little musical instrument. When we saw those big transports come overhead, yeah. had that really weird sound. That's it. Very disturbing. The that's razor that's and a salad bowl. Yeah. Today, Bird is putting sound into a sequence called the pod race. Think drag racers in outer space. How long will you work on a scene, Ben? Like this one with so many layers. Well, I've been with this scene for three years. <laughs> he has to build it in layers. First, the dialogue. Oh, this is gonna be messy. Me not watching. Then crowd noise. Then announcers. Start your engines. And finally, all those engines. And Lucas is still trying to make each individual engine sound just the way he wants. Boom, 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 boom. And then Annie says, so it's the idea of each one having a separate pulse. Each one has a separate pulse so that they, mm -hmm. they build on top of each other and they don't, mm -hmm. they don't collide with each other. A few weeks later in London, Lucas gets the final layer of sound as a hundred piece orchestra, an 88 voice choir, and composer John Williams record a rousing score. Uh, I enjoy the music more than anything because I don't have to do anything. I just let him do it. I said, you know, I want something very powerful and very, very uh, uplifting. And, you know, and then he writes something brilliant. The musical score is the only part of the movie over which Lucas does not exercise absolute control. You're really creating this as, we, as you go along, and, you, mm -hmm. and the movie's coming out in May. Well, you do it day by day, moment by moment, layer by layer. It's just, it's like watching a painter. You just, you know, you put colors, you put colors. It's not done until it's done, you know, until you put the final stroke on it. He says he won't apply the final stroke until about two weeks before the movie opens. That would be suicidal for most filmmakers, but Lucas has his own digital playground, so he can keep directing that battle scene over and over and over. And uh, this guy back here doesn't actually have to get killed. Oh, he can still be there. We'll okay. kill him off screen. When I first met George, I saw somebody with a point of view that was so strong, he didn't allow anybody else's point of view to be, you know, I mean, when George sees something, uh, he sees it through one, set of eyes. The force is with you, young Skywalker. You can see Lucas's point of view in his movies. Good is good, evil is evil. Old-fashioned romance, no nudity or bad language. Sir, sir, I've isolated the reverse power flux coupling. Are you concerned, though, that, that you might be preaching a little bit? Um, well, I'm not sure whether preaching is such a bad thing. For a movie maker? For anybody. What I hear most in my life, from my kids anyway, is dad not on a lecture. And I think most parents get that. Uh, and so being a parent, being a dad, I can't help but lecture. You know, it's in my nature.